During my time as a comedian, there have been three separate occasions where someone has included me on an email chain I wasn't supposed to see. The first time involved money. I was working a gig for a booking agent, and after it ended, a customer approached me saying they wanted to hire me for their company Christmas party. I could have just taken her information and self-booked the gig, but the professional thing to do was to rope the booking agent in. I mean, I wouldn't have been there to land the corporate gig without the booker, and it just seemed right to give them a finder's fee as thanks. So, I created an introductory email of three people, me, the booker, and the client, and explained the situation. The booker responded to both of us kindly, saying he couldn't wait to work with us and that he would start drawing up a contract. Then a second email from that booker appeared in my inbox. When I opened it, I was a little confused because it was about me, but it wasn't for me. When I read a little more closely, I realized he had been forwarding my original email to his assistant and accidentally included me in that forward. The gist of this new email was, is there a way we can go around Nathan on this and get a bigger commission? Maybe cut his pay a little? What's funny is, reading it, I wasn't mad. I just nodded my head and thought, okay, now I know who you are. Got it. Whenever I dealt with them from that moment on, I knew exactly what I was getting into, eyes open. The second time it happened also involved a corporate gig with possibly the worst audience I've ever experienced. A different booking agent landed me this job, and when I got to the conference, I met with my point of contact and had a really nice chat about what they wanted out of me and how the evening would progress. That night, after a few corporate activities, they announced me as their entertainment, and I took to the stage to some of the most tepid applause I've ever gotten. Maybe 10% of the room golf clapped politely. The rest sat with their arms crossed. I greeted them and then told a few jokes to hard stares and complete silence. It was very odd, but I kept going, and the longer I talked, the angrier they got. At one point, and I remember this so clearly that it's almost painful, I pulled out a joke that always, always, always worked, and it barely got a chuckle. I paused, and then, somewhat stunned, said, That's the first time that joke hasn't gotten an applause break. Someone from the audience shouted, Good! They were actively proud of the fact they were treating me poorly. From that moment onward, I went on autopilot. I told the jokes like I was talking to an empty room and did my contracted time. After it was over, I met with my point of contact again and asked what had happened. I told her I had never seen such a hostile audience from the get-go. She apologized and explained they were in a bad mood because they had requested a magician or a hypnotist or something like that. I went back to my hotel room, shaking my head. The next morning, I awoke to find a violently angry email from the booking agent in my inbox asking me just what in the hell I had done on stage the night before. He'd received a complaint from the client who, unlike what she'd said to me about the audience being in a bad mood, blamed me for all that had gone wrong. I was stunned. I knew the show was horrible, but I'd done everything I possibly could to please them. To turn a common saying on its head, sometimes the customer isn't right. Here's where it gets interesting. The booking agent emailed one of his subordinates and accidentally included me in on the thread. They wondered how best to say I misrepresented myself and that they would tell the client that I had sold myself to them as a hypnotist or juggler or whatever the client had wanted and they were sorry, but they were innocent of any wrongdoing. The subordinate happened to be a part-time comedian who had been my opening act on a series of shows and they responded that they had no clue who I was. It was goddamned bizarre to read all of this. What made it worse is the booking agent never talked to me again, never responded to any emails, never took any phone calls. I was blamed for something I didn't do and never given a chance to give my side of things. 
Before I get into the third time I saw something not meant for my eyes, I have to give a little exposition. This is overly simplistic, but right now there are basically three types of comedy clubs in the United States. The first type of comedy club is the buddy system room. Local comedians open or manage a club so that they can swap stage time with comedians in other cities. It is what it is, and there's not much more to it than that. The second type of comedy club is the one that only exists as an excuse to sell liquor. To be fair, every comedy club is concerned with both ticket and liquor sales. No club wants to be in the red. It's just that some clubs treat comedy as something they have to deal with in order to sell drinks, not as something they could focus on to help their business thrive. They aren't interested in comedy, originality, the art or history of comedy, any of it. I know that might sound odd, but not every manager of a movie theater loves movies. Or maybe an even better example is that not every movie producer loves movies. There are now movie companies that are financed by investment firms. They see Hollywood blockbusters making a billion dollars and want in on the action. To them, it's all about numbers. Well, comedy might not be a billion dollar business, but there are still mercenaries out there who treat their club like a job, not a passion. The main criteria for getting booked in these rooms is a television credit. Their thought is, if you haven't been on TV, then you must not be good. Which, for the record, isn't how comedy works. There are hundreds of great comedians out there you've never heard of who haven't been on television. Conversely, there are plenty of comedians who happen to have a really good five-minute set, and that got them a spot on a late-night talk show. But that five minutes is all they really have. When a club puts them on stage and gives them an hour behind the mic, they're exposed and the audience is let down. But, to the club, they were able to market those three important words, as seen on. Because as seen on adds legitimacy to a comedian. In essence, the meaning is, this TV show trusted this comedian, you should too. Finally, the third type of comedy club is the polar opposite of that last room. It is run by someone who fell in love with stand-up comedy at some point in their life, and wanted to be a part of it. Maybe they were too shy to take the stage themselves. Maybe they love comedy, but never had the burn to get behind the mic. They just enjoy the art form. These clubs host open microphones for comedians just getting their sea legs. The owner watches every show, builds a roster of trusted comedians, and creates shows filled with comedians who will complement one another. They work to turn the room into a destination that customers trust. The sell point is comedy, not the words as seen on. No, you might not have seen the comedian on television, the person isn't famous, but you know that every time you're at that club, you go home happy. As a comedian, I tend to do really well in this third type of room, and I don't get booked as much as I'd like by the first two categories. That's the exposition. Here's the final email story. A booking agent gave me an opportunity to work at a comedy club that fits the description of the second type of club. All business, zero art. The booking agent fired off a multi-person email, and the manager of the room, and I'd like to think this was an accident and the manager didn't mean to hit reply all, but maybe it was intentional, I don't know. Either way, the response was that it wasn't worth it to them to put me on stage, as it would be too much work to try and promote the show since I was an unknown. When I read the words, I can't say I was happy, far from it, but it was somewhat nice having my suspicions confirmed. As a comedian, you can invent all sorts of reasons you aren't getting the work you want or that you think you deserve. To be shown the harsh truth so blatantly was almost refreshing. It wasn't about establishing the club as one people trusted to see funny comedians. It was about the path of least resistance. I mean, it was still a kick to the gut, 
but it also made me laugh because it reminded me of a story from The Onion, the satirical news outlet. God answers prayers of paralyzed little boy. No, says God. Hey, that's the end. If you've made it this far, thanks for listening. If you'd like to support me, subscribe to my channel and give my videos a like and share every so often. You can also visit NathanTimmel.com to learn more about me. Again, thanks for listening.